Happy Sabbath. We're glad you're here. Happy Sabbath. We're glad you're here. Hello, church family. Happy Sabbath. We live in a world of unprecedented times where social distancing and isolation has become a lifestyle. The promise of God still holds us together. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. From all of us, happy Sabbath and welcome to El Paso Central. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Before we get into our service, here are a few announcements. Don't forget to keep social distancing, everyone. Six feet apart, and if you do go out, don't forget your cute mask. We want to thank you very much for contributing to the El Paso Central SDA Church. Our church budget has gotten to 6,971. The building fund has gotten to 5,242. These contributions, especially during this pandemic, help our ministries reach people. Do you have a prayer request that you would like the church to pray for? Make sure to call Ms. Prosper Lewanek at 915-227-5633. The day to drop off your tithes and offerings at the church has been changed from September 1st to September 2nd. For fun activities with your friends and family, go to childmen.org. That's all for announcements. Have a happy Sabbath and enjoy the service. Emmanuel wanted to annoy 13-year-old Aggie during a break between French and physics classes at the Seventh-day Adventist school in Libreville, Gabon. He knew that Aggie had a short temper, so he started saying mean things. Annoyed, Aggie immediately slapped the boy on the cheek. Emmanuel didn't like being slapped, and he slapped Aggie back. Now Aggie was furious. He punched Emmanuel. Children crowded around the fighting boys. Don't stop, they yelled. Let them fight. A teacher's assistant came running, causing the children to scatter to their seats. He pulled them apart. Why are you fighting? He was mean to me, Aggie said. He hit me, Emmanuel said. You shouldn't fight. Fighting is for animals. Apologize. As punishment, the boys had to spend two hours away from the other children, quietly thinking about what they had done. It was a long two hours. After some time, Aggie whispered to Emmanuel, Why were you mean to me? I was only joking, Emmanuel whispered back. Aggie wished that he hadn't lost his temper. That summer, Grandfather sent Aggie to a Pathfinder campout. Aggie's Bible teacher also went to the campout, and he spoke for morning and evening worship. At the end of the three-week campout, he asked whether any children wanted to give their hearts to Jesus. He told them how Jesus could change their hearts. Instead of anger, he could give them peace and love. When Aggie heard that, he remembered his short temper. He remembered how his temper led to fights and made his parents unhappy. He wanted to change and he prayed, Lord, I want to follow you. Then Aggie stood up and went to the front. People were surprised to see him standing. His Bible teacher was happy that he wanted to be baptized. After baptism, when Aggie came out of the river, he felt the same as before. He thought maybe something miraculous would have happened, but everything still seemed normal. But as the days passed, he noticed that he no longer enjoyed many things of the past. His friends noticed that he wasn't easily angered like before. Just the other day, Emmanuel brought some cakes to sell in class, and Aggie didn't want to buy one. I don't want to buy anything today, he said. I'm not feeling well. Come on, buy one, Emmanuel said. No, I can't, Aggie said. Emmanuel's face twisted in anger and he slapped Aggie. But Aggie didn't feel angry at all, and he quietly walked away. He was so grateful that with Jesus' help, his days of having a short temper were over. Jesus was changing his heart. In 2017, part of the 13th Sabbath offering helped construct a high school for 280 students in Aggie's hometown of Libreville, Gabon. Thank you for helping change lives through the 13 Sabbath offering. It makes a big difference. Just to remind you of the guidelines I have shared with you before, if you plan to attend, 
our church reopening on the 4th of July, and thereafter, here our day. First, please register your name and family members by texting 915-227-5633 or emailing crosscall at yahoo.com or registering at our church website, alpasocentral.org. From there, you will know once the capacity is reached. Church service streaming continues at our church website for those who cannot attend the live service. Second, your children will be staying with you throughout the duration of the worship service. Third, please stay home if you are not feeling well. Fourth, remember to enter and exit on designated doors. Fifth, please wear your face coverings at all times. Mask will only be provided by, for members and visitors who forget to bring theirs. Sixth, please refrain from physical contact for the safety of others and yourself. Seventh, bulletins will not be handed out by greeters but will be available at the foyer table. Eighth, hand sanitizers will be available. Ninth, seating arrangements will have vacant views in between in addition to six feet distancing between different families sitting on the same pew. Tenth, please drop your tithes and offerings on the plates as you exit the sanctuary after the worship service. There will be only one service until further notice, which will start at 9.30 in the morning with Sabbath school. These announcements will also be posted at our church website, alpasocentral.org. Thank you very much for your patience, and let's continue to pray together for unity and safety of our church fam family. Blessings to everyone. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Let's pray. Our most loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, first of all, for this Sabbath day, Lord, the sanctuary of time that you've given us, Lord, this great gift that you've given us, Lord, 
to get away from the cares of the world, Lord, to come spend it with you, Lord, to love and, and, and adore and worship you, Lord, for everything that you are, everything that you've done for us, Lord, and everything that you continue to do for us. We thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you've blessed us, Lord, both in terms of the things that you've provided for us, Lord, the material things, but also the things, Lord, that we don't necessarily see, Lord, the intangible things, Lord, but those things, Lord, that are such an important blessing to all of us. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we have, Lord, even though we can't necessarily all be together during this difficult time, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are with it, each one of us, Lord. And we, we pray, Lord, that above all, Lord, that your abiding presence be with each one of us, Lord. Be with us, Lord, and help us to know that you're with us, Lord, and help us to be strengthened, Lord, and help us to be to, to, to make it through whatever whatever we might be going through, Lord, whether it's difficult or not, Lord that we know that you're with us and that you guide us through it, Lord. We'd like to ask, Lord, first of all, that you forgive us for our sins, Lord. We know that we're not worthy, Lord, to be in your presence, but we ask, Lord, that you take away any difficult thing, Lord, that might stand in the way, Lord, of allowing you to be with us, Lord. We'd like to ask, Lord, that you continue to Take care of all of us, Lord, in, in, in terms of the difficulties that we might be having, Lord. Some are having difficulty, Lord, with their finances. Some are having difficulty, Lord, with health issues. Some are having difficulty with health issues even within their families, Lord. And, and some have even suffered from the loss of a loved one recently, Lord. And we'd like to ask, Lord, that in, in specifically in those cases, Lord, that you just be with each individual affected, Lord. Let your, let your abiding presence be with each one of them, Lord. Give them strength. Give them rest, Lord, and, and, and help them through these difficult times. We'd like to ask, Lord, that you help each one of us, Lord, in these difficult times, Lord, to gain strength, Lord, be, because of them and, 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 not, and not to be weakened. We'd like to ask, Lord, that you help us to remain faithful to you, Lord, um, during these difficult times. Um, in each of our situations, Lord, where we're alone, maybe, or where we, we don't necessarily... Um, have all the support that we need. We, we pray, Lord, that you would send that support that we need, Lord, and, and, and help us to be strong because of you, Lord. And now, Lord, we'd like to ask that you be with the speaker about to present the message to us. We ask, Lord, that his words be your words, Lord, that they come from you, and that we would gain a blessing, Lord, that we would gain strength, Lord, from this message that we're about to receive. We'd also like to ask, Lord, for for you, Lord, to answer the prayers, Lord, of, of those prayers for each one of those who are watching now, Lord, that you would, that you would bless them, Lord, and again, Lord, give them the assurance, Lord, because we know, Lord, that you're faithful in answering our prayers. We thank you now, Lord, because we know that you're faithful and that you always hear and answer our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? If Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For His eyes on the sparrow, and I know He watches. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear, and resting on His goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path He leadeth, but one step I may see. And I know He watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. And I know He watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For His eyes on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. For His Happy Sabbath, everybody from the Central Church. I'm really excited to be here. Actually, I'm not the only one here preaching. I have um, some faithful members that are in the crowd helping me because it's really uh, scary to preach by yourself. I don't know if you've ever done it. David, have you ever preached behind the camera by yourself? Yeah, it's, it's awful. It's the worst thing ever. So I'm really happy that you guys are here. And happy Sabbath to you guys, whether you're watching from your bed, your couch, wherever you're watching from. If you got dressed in your house, uh, I give you full props. Um, I don't think I would get dressed if, if I was just chilling at home. I think I'd be in my pajamas. But if you did, you get extra points when you get into heaven. So happy Sabbath. That's really awesome. But today, I'm really excited to share with you a message that I've been learning around this week. And it's been processing in my head. And as I've been teaching at EPAJA, um, I, I teach the Bible there. And so for those of you who are sending your kids to EPAJA, I'm telling you, it's an amazing experience. It's been an awesome first week. I had David help me teach my first day. And then I taught at least a little bit more throughout this week. And the kids are just having, it looks like they're having a great time not having to be at home anymore. You know, they can at least interact a little bit with each other. And then we're just learning. And it was so exciting to see your kids so excited to learn about the Bible. And for our younger kids, we're actually learning about the war in heaven. And so we're reading the story of redemption. If you haven't read that book, read it with along with your kids as I'm going to be giving them homework every week to read it. Um, I'm telling you, it's a phenomenal book when how Ellen White just describes the war in heaven in just the beginning. Uh, it's a really good book to read, a bedtime story even. 
And uh, with the older kids, though, we've been re we've been studying about the reality of God. And as I was studying the what is it called the curriculum, I didn't even know what a curriculum was. You know, they never tell you the things you're going to do in ministry, right? Teacher, I thought I was going to be a pastor. But uh, as I was studying the curriculum, there was this one video uh, that the older kids had to watch on Wednesday, and the title of the video was Distorted. And I thought that was so profound because the book. It, it, it begins to talk about the fact that there are so many things in this world that distort our image of God. And so therefore, when we view God and when we see God um, through the eyes of our experience and through our culture and through our background, sometimes the image of God can be distorted. But the thing is, the, the curriculum really wants the kids and the young adults or the high schools, however you want to describe them. They want them to see God for who he really is. And not from the distorted view that they have them from. And uh, when I thought about that, when I was reading the curriculum, I was like, you know what? This sounds like an awesome series to do. Let's share about the reality of who God is. And so uh, this few weeks that I'm going to be giving with you, I really want to go and go deep into the reality of God and begin to take the things that we think of God and that have been distorted, whether, regardless from wherever it's come from. I want to begin to truly see God for who he is and allow him to reintroduce himself to us as the God that is full of love, mercy, and compassion. Um, and so as we begin to go into this series uh, with the Central Church, I'm really excited. Share it with your friends, share it with your family. And then if you get something out of this, go share it with somebody as well. And have a Bible study with them. I'm telling you, you're going to be able, after today's lesson, you're going to be able to take everything you've learned and go have a legit Bible study with them. I promise you're going to be able to do that today. And that's what I'm doing for the next couple of weeks with you guys. Until I get married, and for those of you who don't know, I'm getting married September 20th. And thank you so much for everybody who's, who's wished me luck. I'm going to need a lot of luck. And then a lot of prayer because Elizabeth knows I'm a very difficult person. So pray for her, especially. Amen and amen. Um, I'm going to need help from Milo. You know what I'm saying, Ken? <laughs> I'm in it with Milo every day. That's right. I got my, I got my cameraman behind me. Um, so and before we begin to look at um, this series that I'm going to be calling Distorted, I want to speak with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I'm so grateful to be able to, to, be able to share with the Central Church and anyone else who's watching about the true reality of God. Because Lord, there are so many distorted images of you. But Father, I know that when we see you for who you really are, Father, we will run to you, not away from you. And so I'm really excited. In the name of Jesus, amen. And so as we begin, I want you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. And, and I want you to remember this text because this text is extremely important. That we're going to be back to this text, but I want to bring it to your attention now. And I promise you, as we begin to go through this study, we're going to see how they correlate together, okay? So take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will rest for your, and find rest for your soul. Matthew eleven twenty, and that's Jesus talking. And when I began to think of Jesus and I began to think of the image of God, and I realized something, that we were made in the image of God, right? And I was thinking to myself, what does it feel like to be made in the image of somebody else? And I, and I realized something. I, when I was growing up, I uh, looked a lot like somebody. And surprisingly, I didn't look a lot like my mother, and I didn't look a lot like my father. Um, I didn't like to look a lot like my brother or sister. You know, we praise God for that every day. Amen. But I looked like someone specifically that no one would have ever thought. You know, they would have thought that James would have just, you know, somehow just missed everyone. You know, typically it would have been his son. But I looked a lot like my grandfather. And, and Ken, if you could just click on his face right here. This is my grandfather. My mother said he was around 16 years old. Um, 16 years old. He was a musician, a very popular in Dominican Republic, uh, a really great man. He passed away around three, four years ago. But his name was Joaquin Sanchez, a Dominican young man, um, fantastic with the guitar. I mean, I remember he played with me just a few times. But if you could see, I definitely got his ears. Amen. Amen. I got the ears. My sister used to make fun of me, but, you know, I, I'm proud of that. I got his nose, and my mom is just so amazed that I just look so much like him. And after he passed away, I remember going to a wedding just a few weeks ago, and I was sitting there at the dinner table, you know, with my grandmother right in front of me and my other aunt, and they were just staring at me. They hadn't seen me in a few, a few years. This was just a few weeks ago, and they were just staring at me, 
And they, they just kept staring at me. I was like, Mama, why are you staring at me? You know, I said it in Spanish. And I was like, what, what you doing? Like, do I, have, do I have like a booger or something? And she just said, you look so much like your grandfather. And like, this is him as well playing. And I, I, I didn't believe in myself growing up. You know, I was never ashamed to look like my grandfather, but I never believed it until I saw this photo. When I saw this photo, I was blown away because that, I thought that was me for a second. You know, look. It, he even has, I get his hair. He never grew out his hair like I do. I think he would be ashamed if, if he saw my hair the way it is, but but uh, it was amazing. But I was never ashamed to look like my grandfather. I was actually, I was actually pretty proud. You know, um, I heard of the man that he was. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but I was never ashamed. It made, me, it made me proud to realize that I look so much like my grandfather. And every time I walked in, when I went to my, my family's house in New York, everyone would like look at me and they would, you know, touch my cheeks and they would look at my grandfather and they would put us together. They would always take pictures and it would make me feel so special. The fact that I looked like my, fa my grandfather. And then I began to think more about this concept and the fact that I was proud to look like him. And then I realized that in the Bible, it talks about this specific point, that you and I are children of the Father of God in heaven. He's our Father, He's our Papa, He's our Abba Father, however you want to describe Him. He's our Daddy, you know? And I began to ask myself, is the picture of God in your heart the one that attracts you, attracts, or repels you? Does it, does it draw you in the fact that like, oh, the thing, the way I see God, that's, I really enjoy that and it attracts me. Or, or could it be the image of God that I have kind of makes me want to take a, a bunch of steps back and I, I hate it so much. You know, the image that I have of God is based off of so many different things. You know, a lot of us didn't have a lot of good fathers and our fathers truly are the number one thing that represents our father in heaven. And so I wonder if the image of God that we have is something that disgusts us. Or could it be that it attracts us? But this is an important question to ask as we begin to go through this series of distortion or distorted, however you want to describe it. Because the thing is, do we actually know how God looks? And if we come to realize who, how God really looks, would it attract us or would it repel us? It's such a profound question to ask. And as I was going through the curriculum, Ty Gibson said something so profound. I had to put it in here. He's a phenomenal preacher. He said, when those who claim to know God best convey diabolical things about God, terrible distortions of God's character are inevitable. And that's sometimes, not sometimes, that's a lot of things that happen in the world today. That those who claim to know God and those who claim to look like God Instead of spreading his true character, or they supposedly say they are spreading his true character, in essence, you know, they're just spreading terrible distortions of God's character. That's what they're doing, and it's practically inevitable. A lot of Christian historians, I, I love this quote um, that they said. Um, they, uh, it has been said this, this, this quote right here. Atheism is the bastard child of the church. Born into our world as a violent, check this out, intellectual and emotional reaction against the ugly pictures of God that the church has promised through history. You see, we, we think of atheism as, as this terrible thing, but in reality, atheism has only come about because of bad religion. The Bible even has a name for bad religion. The Bible has a name for bad Christianity. Do you know what it is? It's called Babylon. And the Bible says, get out of her, my people. The Bible's constantly telling people to get out of Babylon because Babylon is the mother, check this out, of whores. Look how explicit the Bible is about bad religion, bad Christianity, bad Adventism. However personal you want to get to it, we can get personal today. But truly, atheism, if I think about it, it's a result of those things. Because when people, it's not that, it's not, atheism is not saying that there is no God. Atheism is acknowledging the fact that there is a God, but they don't want to believe in it. In a sense. To some atheists. And then some atheists actually don't believe in God. And then there's, what is that other one? That other term? 
Huh? Agnostic. Agnostic, right? God came and he just, that's a bad image of who God is. The fact that God came, set everything up, and then just did. And then there are so many other isms that we can think of, but, but in reality, I like how this is put on. Because truly, imagine if the true character of God was revealed through his people. How many more people would actually choose to serve a loving God rather than choose to, uh, to belong to the, the, what is it called? I mean, you know, it's atheism is right there. You know, I have so many doctors in, in like, a, in the central church guys, like they're so smart. Like one day I'll try to get like them, I promise. But as we continue on this, this concept and this, and as we go on through this journey, I think it's important to understand that the number one thing that the Bible is trying to tell us is truly who God is. Constantly, you look in the book of Exodus and God reveals himself through the plagues and he calls them miracles. I will show Egypt who really God is. And constantly God is revealing himself to them. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is so important because when they think of, oh, you're the God of Abraham? And they remember all the things that that God did with Abraham. You're the God of Isaac? And they recall all the things that God did with Isaac and Jacob and Israel. And so God is constantly trying to reintroduce himself to us throughout history. I like, I like this other quote that I was thinking about and that I got from the curriculum. But the one and true God, you know, it asks this question. Could it be that the one and only true God is so beautiful that I would find myself falling in love with him if I truly knew him as he truly is? And that's the question that we have to ask ourselves as we begin to go through this journey. Who really, who is God really? Is he this beautiful God that I would find myself just so attracted that I would draw nearer and closer to him as possibly I could because his character is that good? Or if I come to truly know the true God, and it's a lot of true, 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 right? But if I come to know the true God, would I find myself running the opposite way? And so that's why it's so important that this Next few weeks, um, and I, I'll conclude it right around the week of my wedding. But that we begin to, to see some of the characteristic of who God is. And as we begin to see some of the characteristics, what I want us to do is I'm going to pick one characteristic of God every week. And what I want us to do is take that one characteristic and I want us to put it to the test. And I want us to try it out in our home. I want us, uh, whether, uh, I'm, I have so many various things that we're going to do. We're going to have empathy. We're going to have love. We're going to have forgiveness. We're going to have so many things. And there's going to be, uh, what is that one thing called? That's my first one that I'm going to do. Um, it's called, uh, um, oh man, I forgot the word, but I'm telling you, it's going to be a really good one. Next week, well, I'm not preaching next week. Two weeks from now, that's when I'm preaching at Central. But every week, we're going to look at one characteristic of God. And then I want us, for that whole week, for that full seven days, I want us to put it to the test and do it to our family members, do it to our coworkers, do it to anyone around us. But this week, I want to look at something so unique and special as we begin to understand the true characteristic of God. And God, let me tell you something, God has so much faith in you. He has so much faith in you. And he trusts that you can truly begin to look like him. And you may be asking why, and so let's break it down really quick. Let's go, let's go back as if we were back in Jerusalem and when Jesus was born. And in the time of Jesus, there were a lot of people that they were called rabbis. Rabbis. There were some who were Pharisees, there were some who were Sadducees, there were rabbis all across the world. But pretty much what a rabbi was, he was a teacher who knew the Bible. And at the time, there was no such thing as the New Testament, all there was was the Old Testament. And some rabbis, they specialized in the Torah, some, some rabbis specialized in the prophets, in, in the minor prophets. But for the most part, they knew that Old Testament like the back of their hand. And let me tell you how you could become a rabbi. You see, so from the age of around five, what the children would do after they were weaned off their mother, they would be put into a school, and at the at age from five to ten, they would study the Torah and only the Torah. And that's how they would learn to read and to write. But what they would do is they would take the five books of the Bible, which is called the Torah, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? And they would commit it to memory. And after, after around the age of ten, right, what would end up happening is that the best of, the, of that group, what would end up happening is if you were the best of that group, you would go on to the next stage. But if you weren't that good, you were maybe all right. What they would do is they would tell you as a 10 year old, go continue studying under your father, the profession that your father does or that your mother does and go on your way because you're just not the best. 
But the best would go into the secondary stage of study. And what, after, what they would do from around 10 to around 16, maybe 15 years old, they would study the entire Old Testament. And I'm talking about from Genesis all the way to Malachi. That's a lot of pages, a lot of words. But they would commit it all to memory. And if you, at the end of, at the end of your studying, if you were the best of the best, well, what ended up happening is that you had a chance to become a rabbi. But if you weren't, they would tell you probably politely, hey, you know, guess what? Like, I know you love God, but just go continue and go work with your father. Be a fisherman, be a carpenter, be whatever you need to be, right? But for the best of the best, what they would end up doing is they would try to look and find a rabbi, right? And they would go to the rabbi and they would ask, can I be your disciples? And at the time, a disciple is not just a follower. A disciple is something so profound. A disciple is saying, I want to be everything that you are, everything that you study, everything that you know. I want to be that. I want to be like you. And so what the rabbi would do is he would drill him with questions, question after question about the Torah, about the prophets, about the, you know, the prophecies, all the different things. Because what the rabbi wanted to know is the rabbi wanted to know, do you have what it takes to take upon my yoke? And remember how I told you, like, remember Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Because when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, yoke has, it, it has various meanings. But when a rabbi would say, take my yoke upon you, what a yoke is for a rabbi is all his teaching, his principles, his character, who he is. And so when a rabbi would ask you these questions, he was asking, can you take upon my yoke? Can you be like me? Do you have what it takes? And if you were the best of the best of the best, you know what the rabbi would say to you after he would drill you with question after question after question? He would say, come, follow me. And at that moment, I mean, you would leave everything behind. I'm talking about your family, your mom, your dad, everything you thought you knew. Because your main goal at this time, now that he said those three words, come, follow me. Your whole life's objective is to take upon the yoke of that rabbi. You would follow him day and night, wherever he went, however he slept. You would study everything that he did, the little things. Because again, your main goal was to be like the rabbi. And so as the, as the young disciples would follow behind these rabbis, you know, what ended up happening was as the rabbis were walking, you know, they were walking on dusty streets. And so as they begin to walk, the dust would fly off and they would fall on the, the disciples' shirts or whatever they would wear, their garments, right? And so uh, a wise, uh, the wise men had this saying in the time. They began to say, may the dust of your rabbi fall afresh on you. Because if you were truly walking behind your rabbi, then you should be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And I began to think about the implications to this. I began to think about like, okay, I, I know how they did it. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, those rabbis did it. And it, the, 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 it was the disciple who had to prove to them that they were good enough. But when I look at Jesus, when I look at the true image of who God was, you know, it's really interesting to me. Jesus comes and he's a rabbi. People already know about him. I mean, there's, there's speculation. There's rumors about Jesus doing various things. People are ready to hear about him. And it's not that Jesus goes to the best of the best of the best. No, no, no. Because where does he go? He goes to these fishermen. And if they're fishermen, therefore, at whether they were at the stage of from 10 years old that they were kicked out or from 15 years old that they were kicked out or maybe at 16 years old they were kicked out. But regardless of the fact that they were doing fishermen, if they were doing carpentry, if they were doing tax collecting, whatever they were doing, that means they weren't the best of the best of the best to study the Torah and to become a rabbi. Yet here we have the most profound and amazing rabbi in the entire world comes to them and without even drilling them with questions, without even asking them various diet, like difficult questions about the Bible, he goes to them and he says, come, follow me. Therefore, Jesus had faith that the disciples were good enough that they could do exactly what he does. That they could be like him. Jesus had that faith in them. And one of the examples I want to show you as we begin to delve in 
into who God really is. And, and the first characteristic of God that I want to just, to just show you as we begin to go through this journey is that God has faith in you and that you can do it. You can be the best of the best of the best, not because of what you do, but because he has called you. One of the stories that proved this in the Bible is that Jesus walking on the water. And you can find this in Matthew chapter 14. You can find this in Mark, I believe like seven or eight, I think. And then you can also find this in John. It's not in Luke, but it's in Matthew, Mark, and John. And you can go look at it yourself, study this with your family after church service today. It's a profound study. But here you have Jesus. He, he, he bids the disciples to go and the disciples get in the boat and they ride and they go down the sea. And in the middle of the night, around four o'clock in the morning, I believe, it's either Matthew, Mark, or John says, I don't know, a four hour of the full watch of the night. You have here that they see like some type of ghost walking on the water and they're filled with fear and they begin to tremble. But then Jesus cries out from the winds and the waves and he says, do not fear for it is I, Jesus. And what's so interesting is that, is that Peter, he asks a question, such a profound question that doesn't really make as much sense unless we understand the culture that they're in. He says, Lord, if it is you, command me to walk on the waters as well. Command me to come where you are. Command me to do as you do. And do you remember the the, 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 well, I mean, we could say the theology, but the, the way the system of that world worked at the time. If you were called by your rabbi to come and follow him, the rabbi believed that you could do everything that he does. And if you were truly a disciple of that rabbi, you were trying everything you possibly could do to do exactly what your rabbi does. So no wonder Peter asked the question, if it is you, God, command me to walk on the waters as well. Because he's saying, I am a disciple of you, Jesus. And Jesus, if you're walking on the water, that means that you are teaching me to do the very same thing. That, Father, if you can do the impossible and I'm your disciple, guess what? I can do the very same thing because you have told me to come and follow you. Mm -hmm. So Peter, he waits for the words of Jesus. And as Jesus is on the water, you know what he says? Go read it in Mark. He says, come. And so Peter, probably filled with a lot of fear, but you know what? If I can see my rabbi doing it, I know I can do it. It's not because of what I'm doing. No, no, no. Peter, Peter at first doesn't have faith in himself. He has faith in completely in the Son of God. He has faith in the fact that my rabbi is doing it. And if he has told me to come, I will take that words. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And so I will take hold of the grace and of the words that you have spoken over me. And I will stand upon the water because I believe in the words that you have said. And he gets on the water. And he begins to walk towards God. So profound. And all of a sudden, as he begins to look at the waves to his left and his right, and as he begins to look at himself and sees his insufficiencies and sees like, oh, well, maybe I'm so good or, or whatever we want to describe. There's various teachings that go around this. Spirit of Prophecy talks about this as well. But the main point I want to talk to you about is the fact that he begins to sink. And, and at the moment, you know, Jesus comes, oh. Why did you doubt? Why did you, have, why did you have enough faith, right? And so many times we say, oh, Peter, you should have had more faith in Jesus. Peter, you should have had more faith. But I want to pose this question to you. Could it be that Peter had a lot of faith in Jesus? It wasn't his lack of faith in Jesus. Could it be he didn't believe enough in the fact that Jesus believed in him? Could it be that Peter didn't believe the fact that he had been called to be a disciple? Then maybe I'm not good enough to walk on these waters. And he forgot about the three words that Jesus told him. Come and follow me. And so as we begin to go through this series. And as we are going to be. We're going to be stepping off the boat. Because every week I'm going to ask you to step off the boat. Every single week. I think the first and foremost thing that you got to have. Is you got to have faith that God has called you to be a disciple. 
that God has called you to take upon his yoke. That means that God has said, I know that you can be like me. I know you have what it takes to be exactly like me. I know what you have it takes to do the miracles that I do, to do, to prophesy like God do, to speak and to help like I do. You have what it takes because I have called you and I have told you to come and follow me. And so every week, guys, you believe that you have been called. And if you have been called, you got what it takes because he has faith in you. And if he has faith in you, trust me, that's all you need. Jesus has enough faith for both of us. That's why he says, just bring me a mustard seed of faith. I'll take care of the rest. He's asking you to just step off the boat. So every week that I ask you, implement this into your life. It's gonna be hard. Of course it's gonna be hard because it goes against our character. It goes against who we are. But God doesn't want us to stay the same. If he wanted us to stay the same, he would have never told us to come and follow him. But God has called us to a different lifestyle. God has called us to a different kingdom. God has called us to be his children. And in order to be his children, God says, listen, you got to take upon my yoke. But let me tell you something. My burden is light. And my yoke is easy, man. So I pray as we go through these weeks and I begin to teach you about what God has taught me about the way of Jesus. I begin that, I pray that the image that you have of God that may be distorted by various things in your life, and I'm not excusing it. I'm not saying that you should just let go of it. Of course you believe the way you believe because of what you've experienced, but I'm asking you to give God a chance and allow him to reintroduce your, himself to you. And the first thing I want him to reintroduce himself to you is with this, that he has enough faith that you can are, you are the best of the best of the best. And that you truly could and you can day by day be like him. I believe it. Let's pray to close and, and I can't wait for the weeks to come. Father in heaven, I'm so grateful that you have called us to be like you. And Father, you have, you have said that we can be like you. And so, Father, I don't trust in my own strength. I don't trust in the things that I can do. I don't trust in any of that nonsense. I trust in the words that you have spoken over me. And Father, you have said, come and follow me. So Father, I choose every week, I choose every day, I choose every minute to step off the boat and to walk on the waters, even though it might be scary. But Father, I choose to walk because the faith you have in me inspires me to have faith. And the love you have for me awakens the love in my heart. I'm excited, Lord, and I can't wait for us to grow together as a community, as a church. In the name of Jesus, amen. Blessings to you guys, and I can't wait. So this week, just remember, begin to step off the boat. Because let me tell you something, he thinks you're the best of the best of the best. Happy Sabbath, everybody.